Hi, I'm Dr. Randall Smith with Christian Travel Study Programs, and I'm sitting here in Istanbul today. The Topkapı Palace had lovely gardens with these fountains around it, and still today the Gohana Park is a place where people can come from Istanbul and spend time with their children and, and hang out. It's an ancient city that was the city of New Rome, Constantine City from the fourth century, Constantinople, today called Istanbul. And, and because of that, we go back to some of the early churches, places like Hagia Arini and places like uh, Hagia Sophia, this incredible structure that's still left from the 6th century AD. We also spend some time in the ancient Hippodrome, looking at some of the monuments that were put up there by Theodosius. Interestingly enough, all related to ancient times in the Bible. We, we travel through the city, and it's a wonderful city. It's filled with life and teeming with people, but we spend some time looking at some of the antiquities of the city at the archeological museum, and then go across town and stand in the Grand Bazaar with all of its colors and smells and sounds. This was where East met West, and so it's a fabulous place for us to understand how commerce worked in antiquity. Now, Istanbul is fascinating, but what we actually came to study were the seven churches of Revelation 2 and 3. And in order to start those seven churches, we're going to have to head south. So we go down along the Dardanelles and take a ferry across the Dardanelles or the ancient Hellespont. Then we had to get on to our seven churches. And we went to, to the incredible cities of Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamum, the city of Thyatira and Sardis and Philadelphia and Laodicea. These incredible cities that were so important to the biblical narrative. With each one of those cities, we picked out something that was super important for us to remember. These are exciting times, and when you're looking into Jesus' words, we're going to show you how being in the places will help you understand the narrative better. Join us as we go to the seven churches of Asia Minor in today's modern Turkey. Today we're going to visit that wonderful city at Ephesus, that overwhelming archaeological excavation that will show us what the city looked like when Paul was there, but also when Jesus wrote through the quill of John to that church that was thriving in small houses throughout that city. Join us as we go to Ephesus. Now, let's just take a few moments and think about the letter to the church at Ephesus. And I just want to give you a little bit of background. Um, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people get off of cruise ships at Kushadasa and come over to look at the ruins at Ephesus. Many, many others like us come in on ground tours. But if you were to come to Ephesus in the ancient world, Ephesus was one of the major Roman centers. It was an intellectual center. In fact, there is an, a, a fantastic library there that came uh, from after the time of our story. But at the time of our story, already there was an inscription in the city found that said, um, to Caesar Augustus, who is God. So this was a Neocorite city, a city that worshiped the emperor. And it was smart enough to continue the worship of the emperor by adding new temples to new emperors. During the time of John, a major temple, the largest temple to Domitian, was in fact in Ephesus. So if you lived in Ephesus, chances were real good you were going to put your pinch of incense yearly into the altar and say, Hail Caesar, who is God. Now, Domitian added significantly to it Lord and God 
master of all. You know, he, he really built on the titles a good bit. And um, there are others that have capital inscriptions on them that talk about how the local proconsul offers this offering to the God who is Caesar. And so you see many of those kinds of things. As you go down the street, we'll be able to see not only a major library, we're going to see two fora. One is a, a state agora, a state center for um, transaction of business, and another one is a commercial agora, which is for the transaction of daily goods and services. It has a major way that was built there in the fourth century called the Arcadian Way. It has major marble streets there. You're going to see a 24,000 seat theater at Ephesus, which, by the way, is in the New Testament in Acts 19, because it, there's a significant riot in that uh, actual place. We're going to actually, before that, even go to a small Odeon, a small little theater that's actually the Bulletarian or town council. And that's where the Grammatus, the man who came and rescued the riot in Acts 19, that's his office. So we're going to stand in his office and talk about what he did for Acts 19. Ephesus was amazingly affluent. Um, they are on, the, on the, a major seaport, and as a result, you expect them to have a good number of goods and services. If you want the best of the spices from Asia, they're going to come across and stop off in Ephesus. That's where they'll be doled out. The best spices in the world didn't go to Rome. They came from Ephesus to Rome. So they were fresher in Ephesus than they were in Rome. This is probably the most important center of trade apart from Rome. And it's probably ranks up with Alexandria in Egypt and Antioch, uh, Antioch of Syria, which today would be in Turkey. So I, I want you to expect it to be an intellectual center, but it's also, guys, it's chiefly a cosmopolitan center. You're going to see all different kinds of people in the first century from all over. You're going to have every kind of textile, every kind of spice. This is a place where there's going to be mall upon mall upon mall shopping in the New Testament period. They found a residential area to the city that is 125 acres, and that's 24 streets, one after the other, in north-south direction, one after the other, and seven in the opposite, north-south streets, seven by 24 at residential. And each one of those blocks is an insula block, so there are tenement houses. So imagine this is a big, big city. Interestingly enough, three of those tenement houses have been excavated, and there was a uh, Swiss and a German team that came in and did engineering to put the uh, foundations of, of these stepped houses. It's kind of on a hill, and Ephesus is built in a valley between two major hills. And because some of the residents has like an up and down kind of rise and ebb and flow of a, a hill, um, they did this kind of new excavation technique and really were able to uncover some exciting finds from the residences. At the entrance of the city, on both ends, there's a major bath complex. Um, there's always, at the edges of town, bathing complexes and gymnasia. This is a town that has a lot of um, really up-and-coming people in it. If you want to be somebody, you want to, you want to be a ruler in Ephesus, well-known politician, because it's kind of like a senator can more easily become a president. Um, the proconsul of Asia is, is the plum pick of a place for an, a political uh, appointment. At the state agora, I'm going to show you where the state agora was, the state open market. And in the state forum or the state agora, agora being Greek, forum being Roman, same place, just different, different names. At the, the entry of the state agora is the place where the incense burner for your loyalty to the emperor burning would be found. And it's interesting. We have this image of this soldier in Thessaloniki offering incense. And it's interesting. Uh, toward the end of the first century, when Domitian sent out a decree, he said that all the empire should, and I quote, worship him as God the Lord. I'm trying to figure out how you structure legislation to say, you may all call me God the Lord, okay? But it gives you an idea of what kind of guy this, uh, this is. So I want you to see that Caesar is Lord is a major theme. You would see it on chariot bumper stickers.
Caesar is Lord, Caesar is Lord. And this is a place where it would be expected that you understood that. Refusal could obviously um, get you in prison, but it also could result in confiscation of your property and even death. So Christians that refused would actually say, Jesus is Lord, and that could get you thrown in prison, boiled in oil, um, could get you um, all of your stuff uh, confiscated. Now, Domitian's death is in 96, but the demand for false worship of the emperors continues even after him. So it's true that when he dies, there's an easing of the pressure, but it doesn't mean it's over. There's another 150 years, 130 years of persecutions. The other thing is, in addition to the Neocorite status and the Caesar worship, this is a great place for the worship of pagan deities, second only to Pergamon. Pergamon is the chief location for all worship of deities, but Ephesus is second to it. In Ephesus, at the time of John, there were, I count, 14 idolatrous temples, 14 temples. Um, but none of them, none of the 14, rivaled the one just outside of town sitting on a hill called the Temple of Artemis. So the Artemision was the big one, and it's outside of town. The reason we don't really spend time at the Temple of Artemis is because when you were at Sardis, you saw a really good-looking one. The one at, in Ephesus is now pieces of the um, stylobate and bottom of two columns. That's it, because it was completely burned and is gone today. But for our purposes, we're going to actually spend a lot of time walking through the streets of Ephesus. Now, something else you should know, the place was uh, known for rampant sexual immorality. Not everything that happened in Ephesus stayed in Ephesus because some people took the disease with them, if you know what I'm saying. And here's the thing. I want you to think of the challenge that comes to a person who's, um, they're an early Christian, and every May to celebrate their birthday, the birthday of the cult of the city, they would celebrate by traveling the sacred way, and it is the main parade in May that all Ephesians go to, the Artemision Parade. And here's the thing, all you have to do is not be there to be suspect. So are you gonna show up? Are you as a Christian going, I don't believe in Artemis, but I like parades? Remember there was, um, some rabbis who were debating at the time of Jesus, just before the time of Jesus, can you tie your sandal at the foot of a pagan altar? The question was, you were supposed to, before you go into a pagan site, bow before a god. So if you're going to go to a gymnasium and you go past a, a taiki or, or a hygiene, can you bow before a pagan god? Well, as a Jew, you can't bow before a pagan god. But if your sandal happened to be untied when you walked up, you could bow to tie your sandal and walk in, and people would see you bow, but God would know you were just tying your sandal. Okay? The question is, how much like them can I be and still be what I'm called to be? That's a problem for an Ephesian. But that's also a problem in, miss in missions for many people in many backgrounds. So I want you to imagine everybody's dancing around. The uh, statues of Artemis are, are, are um, uh, being dipped into water and being paraded around on the street, and you're a Christian, do you show up? Do you walk with the crowd? Do you open your shop that day? Do you ignore the whole thing? Do you get a, a sudden fever and stay home sick? How many years can you pull that off before people start wondering? So honestly, to the early church, they're living in a society that's a real challenge. But none of that None, all of that paled in comparison to how hard it was after Domitian came to the throne and said, thanks for living in my city that's dedicated to me. Make sure you worship me regularly. So we're going to be talking about um, from the time of divine Augustus all the way through divine Domitian, that's several emperors later, these people are coming together and are being forced into this. I think one of the important things, too, is that Ephesus has the best statue of Domitian in a temple. And um, if you wanted to see what the emperor looked like, you could go to Ephesus and see the latest iteration of the statues of, of the emperor. It's interesting because next to Nero, Domitian has the most brutal, 
persecution of the early church. And so look for the time of John and his pastorate to be a particular time when you didn't want to be a pastor. And so here it is. Jesus is going to write to a church that's in a time of a real grip of a problem. I think one of the important things is that we should ask ourselves, how could he claim to be God? Remember that gods were not all-knowing, all-present. They were localized and they solved problems. So if the emperor was God, what it meant was sponsored by the emperor who keeps dredging out your harbor. If you stop worshiping me, I'll stop sending money. We'll stop dredging the harbor. And today, the harbor is now kilometers away from the the sea. Why? Simply because the river that's coming down is bringing heavy, heavy silts. We were talking about the religious tradition here. With the Artemision, obviously what everyone would have said, if you asked anyone in the Roman world, what do you know about Ephesus? They would say, well, the great temple of Artemis is there. They might not know anything else about it, but they know that there was a a very important Artemis temple, the Artemision. Every May, every May, people would gather for the grand parade for the Artemision, and all the way through the sacred way that you're going to walk, people would be in a frenzy in the night, parties going all night long through May, people castrating themselves and dedicating themselves in a frenzy to Artemis. But this wasn't the only thing that you should know about the religious nature of this city. There was also a very strong oracular ministry here, oracles. Now, when you say oracles, you speak of something like the Delphic Oracle, the Oracle of Delphi. You speak of people who are over top of chasms of gases Uh, wafting up and they're giving you certain kinds of futuristic type statements and things like that. But you should know that these uh, oracles often are um, like the Temple of Didymus here had grand oracular pronouncements and people would come and get spells on their enemies, curses for their neighbor that was treating them wrong, all kinds of things that they would do and that there were all kinds of frenzied worship. Think, add a large amount of wine to a small audience, get the tempo of the music up, and get them whipped into a frenzy, and you get the idea. So when Paul writes to the church at Ephesus, and he says in Ephesians 6 to put on the whole armor of God and to remind them that they're not wrestling against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, you should see that he was not calling Christians just to be like Christ. He was calling them to be like Christ in an anti-Christ environment. This is a really powerful place from a dark spiritual location. I live near a city. That city is spiritually dark. It's not just lost people. It's spiritually dark. And when you go there, you will know very, very soon after you've gotten there that it is a center for witchcraft and darkness. That sense that I have when I go to that nearby city is the sense that a Christian would have living in Ephesus. And I would remind you that John is pastoring the group of people in that environment. So he's asking them to be like Christ in, a, in a, an environment that is Christ-denying and anti-Christ. And, you know, whether it's taking a pinch of incense and putting it out for the emperor to worship him, or whether it's standing in May in the frenzied crowds for the Artemision, or whether it's going up to the oracular shrines, and I would say it this way as a Christian, demonic shrines. People are getting advice from people who are avowedly against anything that we would represent as God. So here's the thing. When Jesus writes to them, he's writing specifically angled to a people who have been through a great deal. Now, we're going to walk through and look at the state Agora and the Domitian Temple and then make a hard turn and go down into the city to its north-south Cardo passing by a very large and famous uh, library of Celsus and making our way over toward the theater 
And somewhere along that way, we're going to stop and we're going to talk about Jesus' letter. Remember, you're talking about Paul here was teaching in the school of Tyrannus here, which would be attached to one of the large gymnasium areas. Um, he's here for quite a long time, the largest dedication time of Paul to any site outside of Jerusalem had to have been Ephesus. Three years he's here. He's here two years uh, during the gospel's permeation in Acts 19, sending out people in all directions with the gospel and building up the churches. So he spends a lot of time in Ephesus, but you have to understand that is the largest commitment outside of Jerusalem in the New Testament of any body of believers. So the power base of the church was Jerusalem first, Ephesus second. Antioch is probably third. Uh, if you're looking in terms of the amount of emphasis and the conglomeration of the early church and its emphasis in mission, they recognized that Antioch was a sender for the Eastern Mediterranean, but Ephesus was the sending church for most of the Western Mediterranean. So it became a very important base. We're going to try and answer a question that I know sh some of you should have because we're missing something in the New Testament. We know that John was told to be take care of Jesus' mother, and we know that John ends up in Ephesus, Patmos, and back to Ephesus. What we don't know is where John was between the time in early in the book of Acts he was a pillar of the church, according to Galatians 2. He's a pillar of the church of Jerusalem. And how does he end up in Ephesus? There's a, there's a missing piece. And there's been a number of writers who have taken it in hand to try and figure out what happened to John. But we do know that John picks up the pastorate in Ephesus after Paul. In other words, it appears as though John is doing something else during this time. But after Paul is killed in 67 and Peter dies shortly in, in the same space of time under the Neronian persecution, John will pick up pastoral ministry and spend the last three decades of his life basically in Ephesus. So when we go to Ephesus, we're looking not only at a great city from the standpoint of what it looks like, we're also looking at a fantastic city for the outreach and the, the work of the early church. Because Paul will be there, he will leave it to Timothy, and John will come in next. And eventually, 30 years of John, except for the, during the time he was sent to Patmos, and the time they tried to boil him in oil, but that's another story. Um, you, you know, there were some moments when he wasn't there, but for the much of the time, he's discipling the group in Ephesus. You add the time that Paul spends here, the time that John spends here, the time that Timothy spends here, and the heavy hitters of uh, the first century invested a great deal in Ephesus. Why? Because it's the mother of the Asian churches which is kind of the capital of the entire vase. Well, it, in point of fact, is the provincial capital of the area, or the provincial capital of the air, area. So we're going to take a walk around through one of the monumental cities, one of the great cities of the New Testament. I think you're going to love it, and we're going to spend some time in Revelation chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. <laughs> Let me just show you where we are because this is going to help you a lot more. It's going to be hard for you to tell, but we are here. The actual beginning of the city, you see the road continues, the processional road. The Magnesian Gate is out there on the road where we made the turn. You know, north side of Jerusalem, there's Damascus Gate because it goes to. So this is the Magnesian Gate because it goes to. I was waiting for somebody to say Damascus. <laughs> no, <laughs> Magnesia, right? So the Magnesian Gate. But that's not its prime use. There's a right down the street here, about here, halfway between where we're standing and the gate, was found an interesting little um, uh, inscription on the processional road that was actually inscribed along the road that says this is the route for the great May parade the Weirs Triumphalos, or Triumphalos, the, the triumphal march that was for the great uh, Artemision, the god, uh, goddess Artemis. So, so uh, uh, you, what you're looking for is something that would give you an indication of where the parade route was. If you travel with me to Rome, I will take you to places where there are arches. You're familiar with the Arch of Titus. What arches are, are processional route turning points. 
basically you, you define the root, then you put up an arch and say, my great event that I'm remembering with this arch is another Roman event at the back end of many great Roman events. So the more, more victories you have, the more arches you're gonna have. The more great moments in Roman history with me, Caesar says, you're gonna have another one of those. This isn't that same kind of procession. The Artemision, which is all the way over here, was actually had a processional route that went down here, came in just up the way there, and went right down the road we're going to go on, following this route all the way into the city, then turning to the north, this is the Cardo, up past the Acts 19 Theater, and moving all the way up and out to another gymnasium. As if you'd need a gymnasium if you did a walk like that. But then it turns at the gymnasium, and the, uh, the procession route goes all the way back to the Artemision. Now this was a platform higher than the city. Not a lot higher, but somewhat higher than the city. And interestingly enough, the tomb or burial place for John is now known behind it, up on a higher cliff. Because in the Byzantine period, they wanted to remember it. So the Church of St. John is up here, the Artemision is up here. Now, if you look in a commentary, it will say that Ephesus, and this is not the original site of Ephesus. Ephesus used to be off of, at another site. It was moved over here intentionally during the Hellenistic period. After Alexander the Great and the Hellenists and the rise of Hellenism, now I'm talking about uh, uh, 200s BC, uh, it was moved over here and built with a orthogonal plan, a, a hippodomic plan. And you can see here some of the streets, and there was 24 of them, and seven going the other way that had been found in residence. This was built between that mountain, but in a commentary, you'll read the Mount Pion, P-I-O-N. Pion becomes Pane, Pane. You can see kind of a little bit of a, a transposition. This mountain, Pion, this one was called Cressus, and between it, it is, there's a, a valley, and the valley goes down this way, or it follows this. The residence area is out there. 125 acres of residences are out there. And if you look up on the side, we're gonna see in several places where you can see a very high wall line on top of the mountain ridge. So this was a big city with an upper part up here, an upper part over here, residential, but the downtown area split in two. Commercials on the far side. This will be the commercial area over toward the harbor. That makes sense, right? Entertainment district in the center with all of your famous theaters, brothels, and other uh, places for entertainment. And then residential down here and a state agora, a state place for the um, uh, state business and the worship of the emperor over here. So that's how the site divides out. Do, do you have a sense you know where you are? Okay. So we're going to say the, the, uh, the end of town over here is, is uh, going to be a gate that you're going to actually drop down inside the site and be lower over here. Lower city, upper city, above city. Okay. This was a powerful, big, wealthy worship center, commerce center, state center, celebration of the emperor center, whether you wanted to or not, because after all, it's good to be a Roman, sponsored by Roman, sponsored by the Roman emperor, right? And if you'll make your way with me, I want to walk around to these buildings here and you'll see what looks like a small theater, the Bulletarian. That's where I want to stop first. Now, take a look at these uh, water pipes for just a minute. On your left, notice the water pipes. And you'll notice that there are several places where you can see the on the uh, female uh, fitting of the pipe, there's places where there's very thick plaster, the lime plaster, and the pipes would be running all underneath the residential area of town. And of course, they're running from an upper place, but you can use a siphon tube to bring water up. Here, there was a, a flowing water system throughout the town. So if you lived in Ephesus, you had fresh water, running water in many fountains in the town, and we know where a number of these fountains are. So people all over town are able, especially over here, to come and get water from their fountain and go back to their house. Remember, most of them are living in tenement houses. And if you're living on the third or fourth floor, it's a, it's a wood structure up there and you're, 
your chamber pot and your mat are some of the only things you own. And so a bursting chamber pot coming down four floors, coming down onto the street, often would flow over onto the street. And so in two places in this town, uh, what they would do is actually run the water from the fountains, put a little um, sleuth down, and then actually run it out into the street so that they, they could try to keep the streets clean. It was a way of working with it. But you have to understand that in antiquity, people smelled things. They got used to smells you don't get used to. Let's put it that way. Because some of you told me this morning you weren't, weren't even going in that building, okay? So obviously they were more used to it. Let's get down just a little further. When you cross over the, the stylobates, you'll see there's a big pedestal building here. Basilica is a style of building. It's a style that is used by law courts. Later on, a basilica is picked up by churches and used in the early church period. I'm talking 300s to 600s Byzantine period. And so we call a basilica today a church with a papal visit, that kind of thing in the Catholic Church. But a basilica originally was the style of a building and law courts were basilicas. There are some basilicas back here that have, these are called the Basilica of the Stoa of the Porch the porch law courts or the porch main courts, okay? Now I wanna bring you back to the bulletarian. Okay, what this was was the town council building. Hey, something else about this building. Right down here and right down here, there are office rooms. There's a guy who worked here in the first century and he's in the story of Acts 19. He worked in this building. He's called a grammatus, he's a scribe, or he's the guy who's kind of in charge of taking the town council and announcing it in the other theater, the 24,000 seat theater, to the town. So the decisions made here, there's a guy who runs between these two, and we're gonna walk between it. There's a guy who runs between the two, and when Paul has a riot caused against him, and, and great is Diana of the Ephesians, and great is Diana of the Ephesians. It's true, this isn't the theater where it happened, this is where the guy worked that went and saved Paul and got him out of there the Grammatus. Okay, when you get over here, look at the area between. It looks like a graveyard, it's not. This is this large open plaza. It would have had large stoas on the sides or porches, porticos, and the big open center. And in the very center of this was a temple to the divine Julius Caesar sitting up over the here. This is the state agora, the state piazza, the state forum, state functions, and this is the provincial governing body of the entire of Asia Minor. Every other city has been paying homage to this city and is waiting for judgments from the emperor and through the provincial governor of this city. So major things are happening here that relate to, let's call Asia Minor your state and your state governor is here, even though your federal head is in Rome. Does that make sense? All right, so this is basically state ground zero. But on one of the corners, and we have a written source that says at the corner of the state agora was the incenser where you would put your incense once a year, and at your birthday, you had to show up in public and say, Caesar, he is God. Okay, think about that moment coming up on your birthday as a as a Christian. Can you do it? Can you muddle your way through it? Is, is that the place, is that what you should die for, those words? It's interesting, earlier, um, who was it that was telling, asking about the mission question? Was it you? Well, would you tell them what the question was? It was, this was a brilliant question. In our work in the Philippines with the tribal people, we run into something similar to what you spoke about yesterday, about the necological uh, sites and people worshiping their ancestors. In all of the Philippines, there's a holiday where families come together, they come home from all the places they live, and they make food and they go to the grave site. And this is considered part of their tradition or their culture. So my question is, when people come to know Jesus, should they stop that tradition and that they consider part of their culture now that they know Jesus and they know right from wrong? Does everybody understand the question? What's your response? How, okay, first of all, can we all admit it's a tough one? It's tough. 
Because you can walk around going, well, I know God's word and I know that you should distance yourself from these pagan things. Now you live where everyone you know and everyone you've ever known thinks that way. I'm not trying to soften the commitment to Christ. I'm trying to get you to feel it. Because I think we've had a 200 year ride with the wind blowing on our back and we forget what this is. There is coming a time very soon when we will have to stand up for Jesus Christ in very uncomfortable and, dare I say it, un-American ways. And because the government defines something a marriage doesn't mean God does. Because government embraces a 120-year-old gender ideology does not mean the Creator does. And I don't get to be Jesus' PR person. I'm not supposed to make his, his message easier so people like him more. But I'm also not supposed to be obnoxious and hateful and hard to get along with. And some of us are doing the right thing with the wrong words and wrong heart. And some of us are doing the wrong things with the right heart and right words. And are any of you finding it's getting harder and harder because even on our team, we, we not only don't know how to do it, we don't even know how to stand together because I don't know what you're going to say. And now big media ministries are broken down in a heartbeat. It takes nothing to pull apart what lo looks like the big up and coming pastor. Next thing you know, that whole church is wiped out. We've seen it too many times. I'm saying, I think it's a brilliant question. I think in Africa, we had the situation where people were going and leading people to Christ and saying, that God has a design for marriage that's one man and one woman. But to the man who had his five wives, the earliest missionaries got there and impoverished, bastardized the children, impoverished the whole group of, of women. And it was tragic. And so they became bitter and anti-Christian. Now, conversely, God did say what a family is. So what did you want the early missionary to do? I think we went to Hawaii and we brought the gospel to people who were wearing grass skirts with nothing underneath of them and nothing else on them. And there's a wonderful shot from, I think it's 1885, of a black and white picture of Hawaiians that were saved. And they are wearing British long underwear from here all the way to here with a grass skirt over top. Here are the Christians. And we've got to be careful because sometimes what we're carrying is our culture and not our faith. So these aren't easy issues. I just want you to feel what it was like to be a first century Ephesian. Mm -hmm. And I want you to know something. I think God had me born in the 21st century, uh, in the 20th century, living into the 21st, because I was a lightweight. And some of these guys were heavyweights. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty easy for me to walk around, you know, from the cheap seats saying how they should have done this and they should have done that. Mm -hmm. I've never had to put a pinch of incense into anything in order to keep my head. And can I just tell you, I may not be cute, but I like my head. I like where it is, okay? So let's take a walk. Hey, just over there, there's a building. And on the far end, can you make out some arches? Okay, the arches are a pedestal and the pedestal is the temple of Domitian. You know, the vaulted chambers were actually the Domitian temple sat on top. It was later rededicated um, after Domitian but it, at least during the time of John, that would have been the vaulted chambers over there and it was all, a large elevated platform with the Temple of Domitian here. Sponsored by your Roman emperor. Don't you love Rome? Please say so now. Can you see there's three levels to the gallery? There's an upper level here and then there's a second level and there's even one down below it. So this was, look how much was involved in making a huge pedestal for Domitian's uh, temple. You can tell these guys were really, really into making sure that he felt that he was being cared for. I'm just trying to get you to be able to visually see where you're at. Now, get a sense of the town because this Agora, the state Agora, has as many streets that are going up that hill with residences on them and all the way back past where we were standing. That's two thirds of the way to the end of the residences. So go back to where we came in. Now go another third, residences are 125 acres, all this area. Do you notice that over here, they've got a covering. The covering is over those three residences that they've taken the time to restore 
It's, it's brilliantly restored. It's a little bit difficult because once they do a restoration on things with frescoes, people go into a closed room and the moisture level goes up and the frescoes begin to come apart. So they're working on techniques that we can preserve some of this because they can actually do this whole area here. Uh, you can see that there's a cutout and, and they've already got the base of another house and they can, they've got two more houses in between. They know right where they are. They've got ground penetrating radar. They can show it to you, but they haven't uncovered it yet. The problem is this, until we have the ability to properly preserve it, they don't want to dig it up. And so I think it's, it's helpful that they're doing that. Now there's this downtown area, there's as much on that side of it as this side of it. So you should feel that you're kind of at halfway point when you're out underneath that tree at the Temple of Julius Caesar, okay? Just trying to give you the feel, the feel of the town. And then when you come down further into the town, you're gonna see some important places like be a fountain down here that we're gonna see, a monument over here. And then the street turns and you can see the street heads down and come right to the, uh, two-tiered building, that's the Kelsus Library. It's deceiving when you see this, um, this set of arches there, because the arches were all covered uh, with a marble front, and then the pillars that came out from it had a beautiful um, architecture in front of this. So you actually didn't see the temple sitting here, you'd see it all the way up top. It'd be sticking out or permeating off the top. If I were standing here making the, the turn to go up to the main residence area of the city, I would turn and the last thing I'd see coming out of my commercial area, so down there's where I work, up here's where I live, that's just government center. But for me to get from where I work to where I live, I have to pass government center. And when I do, what's the temple standing above me? The emperor, right? So there's a lot of that uh, going on. Now, in the period of 100 BC, down to 50 BC. It's the undoing of the Roman Republic. And in that period, there are several generals that rise to prominence. Can anybody name a general that rises to prominence, dies in the Ides of March? Julius Caesar, right? But there's other men who preceded him that were also revolutionary men. One of them was Sulla. His grandson was named Memmius. This monument is to the grandson of Sulla. Uh, and that's the Memmius Monument. These monuments are put up for a variety of reasons, but take, I want you to take a look at the picture of what this was. This is just pieces, but look at this. Look at the beautiful, look at this. And Gaius Memmius was important here, and all they're doing is erecting this as a straight memorial. This guy is a, a wealthy patron in the city with a grand Roman past. Celebration of victory heroes, celebration of gods. These are all part of your regular Roman life. And of course, Nike over here. So we'll take a walk around, just keep coming down toward the commercial section. We're leaving government center. We're coming toward the commercial section. The street we're on is called Corets Street, Corets. The curates are like um, a council of leaders in the town. And so it's town council and they're the people that are uh, overseeing the work between the state and the commerce community. And they're literally between the state and the commerce community here. Now, I want you to put yourself back in time. I want you to look over to the right as you're walking, look over to the left, and there'll be periodic pedestals with some dedication. This is the celebration of men and their past. So this one has still a, um, a lovely a look of a, of a statue on top of it. All these others had statues on them as well, all the way down. So you could walk along and literally be talking about, oh, and then there was Uncle Harvey over here, and then there was, then there's Brother Joe over here. And it was one thing after another to tell the story of the history of the city. Now, if they took this down, they would get more of those houses right along this slope. So the houses closest to the commerce were some of the houses that were belong, belonged to the families that worked in the harbor. We know that two of these houses, these are ship and dock workers, union members, by the symbols that were on the outside of their house. Were they wealthy? We assume they're quite wealthy because of the nature of the things that were found inside of it. The interesting thing is the normal conventional wisdom is the higher up the hill, the better the breeze, the better the breeze, the higher price the neighborhood. That's not true here. There's, the wind is not your friend off the water. And so they tend to want to be 
on a hollowed section right here at the lower part of town. They had some of the best water flow um, and they really had pretty moderate weather. This is a fountain that was erected in, uh, to honor the Emperor Trajan. And this is just the beginnings, a little bit of the terrace housing that belonged to the residential section. But look at this, this is an excellent diagram. So this is house number one. This was a house. It goes, it goes in and back behind that. There's another house that's an odd shaped one out at the corner. Most of them had uh, taverne on the lower levels, that is workrooms or shops that were selling right out of the front and had upper rooms. We know that most of them have uh, all the normal things that go with a Villa Urbana, uh, including a gynoseum for the women and all those kinds of things. Another very large bath complex is on the right. From 135 AD, second century, Temple of Hadrian here. Okay guys, a fellow by the name of Celsus. Sometimes they say the library of Celsus, but that's because of the Brits and the way it was pronounced. His name was Celsus, it was a hard K. Um, 125, Celsus died and his son wanted to celebrate his dad as a hero. I think this is a great story. And he wanted to do something really big, but he decided that instead of just celebrating with a, a heroon, like a monument of some sort, he would give money for a library. His father was apparently very important to his learning, so he gave money for a library. And as a result, the library that was put here was a library to help celebrate uh, what we would call the various disciplines of philosophy, if we wanted to say it that way. Um, the library itself has four women personifications in the front of it. The very first one, Sophia, is wisdom. And then you've got uh, Rete is next. Uh, and you got uh, judgment is next. And expertise is next. So each of them has a, a, uh, a kind of a, a little apse with a lovely statue. And so this is what you're supposed to be learning. Now, when you go in, remember that a library was not very big. The building, the front of this building looks big, but a library was quite small. It was a scriptorium that was quite big. Meaning, if we were gonna, let's just say, keep the Bible alive. Every generation, I would read out loud and each of you would make a copy on long benches. And that one copy would be put in a library, but have to be replenished every generation for all 1189 chapters of scripture. I'm the guy who counts, right? 1189. So all 1189 would have to be copied every generation in order to stay alive. The reason we don't have most of the books from antiquity is because they don't last. They're made of uh, on medium that don't last. Now we've perfected that. We keep changing the digital medium about every five years. How many, how many of you remember floppy disk? Okay, so we just keep changing the medium. So what lasts? Books. Ironically, they're the things that last the longest now. But the Kelsis Library. Now, there are other buildings uh, alongside here. And in this area of the city, there appears to have been a number of buildings that we're not sure what their uses are, but there are some who um, suggest that they are brothels. That would not be unusual. In the downtown district, there are some markers over here we'll show you on the stones where um, ladies who are plying their craft will, will stand over at the markers. Sometimes they would even put something on the bottom of their feet, like an arrow, and, and sit or stand like this, as in, go with me, follow me. In some Orthodox traditions today, it is still wrong to lift your feet off the floor during worship. So you can't do this. They, they will, someone will come along and say, put your foot down, put your foot down. They're both in Russian and Greek Orthodox. That comes from this ancient tradition. People would go to church services and they'd sit like this as invitations to let you know to follow them when the service was over. Because after all, they're gonna go where business is good. This of course is the historic cat of Kelsus. Uh, this is uh, generations ago was the original Kelsus cat. This cat is from that line. I'm totally making that up. So imagine you have a library here, the, the possible brothel there. By the way, just something you'll read. Two of my commentators say that there is a tunnel that goes between the brothel and the library. It does not exist except for it preaches well, okay? Guys, look, I just have to tell you that sometimes 
I, there was a, a Methodist bishop who went around to a church and he got there and he started preaching about Simon the Leaper. And he had Simon leaping from here and over to Mount Tabor and Mount Hermon to Mount Carmel. And there was a young guy in the back who came up to him at the end and he said, uh, uh, Sir, it's not Simon the Leaper, it's Simon the Leper. And he said, You're a seminarian, aren't you? He said, Let me tell you something, son. You never give up a sermon that works over the pronunciation of a word. Okay? So here's what I want you to know. There's a lot of stuff that just ain't so. There is no tunnel between those two buildings, okay? For some reason, since the 1970s till now, um, tourism that talks about the seedier side of life has always gotten the press. I don't know why. And what's funny is, rising in a time when we're still trafficking humans, we're still kind of making fun of all the prostitution stuff. But there were symbols in Roman streets that told you where brothels were. They're all going to gather around a, 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 an etching of a foot that's in the, the place over here. And it's going to point you in the direction of the nearest brothel. They're all over town. We find them in er, uh, Herculano, Herculaneum. We find them in Pompeii. There are little symbols that were all over town. Now, I, I just want you to think about something. We sh I told you earlier about the symbol of the Wigales or the Vigales. They were markers that were in the center of the town that would just be on, uh, etching on the concrete where the, where the guys with the torches would stop. They knew exactly where to stop and to proclaim the time of the night because they're all over the town. Okay? Much of these streets have been um, changed since the ancient period and have been updated. And so some of those were taken away and, and those were prizes. It looks like the top of a legionary pole where it has a circle with two little stunts and a little ears on the outside. You know what I'm talking about? Something that Romans carried? They're etched into the stones. I can show you one in Scythopolis. It's one of the only ones that hasn't been stolen. Okay? So you have symbols like that that are station markers. We get the stations of the cross in Jerusalem from station markers from the fire department or the local torchbearer. But the idea of getting people to stop in certain places. But this is terrible to admit. But we get that marker for Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior, outside of a, a Christian home. Where did it originally come from? Markers for brothels. In the history of mankind, often something that was meant for good becomes evil, and something that was meant for evil becomes good. The same casting places that casted church bells made the first canons. You will see this happen over and over in church history. I would like to see us redeem the things that were meant for evil. Nobody in this crowd is, uh, is unaware that pornography drove the internet. It also drove the VCR. That's why we all ended up one with one, and that's why they were so cheap. Pornography drove the industry. I'd like to see us take the net and redeem it, and take the things that were meant for evil and turn them into good, but it takes intention. And you'll see several markers here to indicate to you several things. Very likely what we have is the direction of the brothel, and that's one of the things that adds to the idea that that corner place across from Kelsus's library is a brothel. But you also have a marker here for uh, a lady whose hair is up. In the Roman period, all males dressed the same. Women largely dressed the same, but their hair was the variable. And they would plait their hair and raise it up, and so would priestesses. So sometimes you see these and you see them as curls going upward, spun in spirals, and you literally would take what looks like a spring of gold or brass, put it in your hair and spiral your hair through it and have it pop out the top, okay? And so they, they had some of these. It could be a goddess or it could be a woman of the night. Okay. I want to get you down here to the theater, so we're going to make our way down. 24,000 seat theater, part of the story of Acts chapter 19, worth seeing. And I want to make sure you get enough time to get in there. What I'd like to do is two things here. Acts chapter 19 takes place where you are. Now, this, this is a one period site theater created when Claudius becomes emperor in the year 41. 
and destroyed in 98 or decimated or reused or repurposed. But for our purposes, what's important is it's here when Paul's here. The place is teeming with life. Now, here's what I want you to see. I'm reading from Acts chapter 19, verse 11. Listen to this, the word of God. Acts 19, 11. God was performing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul. Stop right there. That didn't happen through most of his ministry. I mean, there was the occasional Eutychus falling out of a window, but that was more of, you know, um, spiritual first aid. But for normality's sake, powerful things were happening. Listen to me. You're in a town filled with demonic activity. You're in a town filled with oracular spirits. You're in a town filled with emperor worship. You're in a town with 14 temples, not counting the art of mission outside of town for which the whole town is known. You are at pagan you in pagan central. And God shows up and begins to do what only God can do. And nobody can deny that miracles are happening. Let me tell you, the hardest thing for the enemy to combat, the hardest thing is change lives. It is. You can argue all kinds of things, but it's hard to argue against a marriage that was, was now restored and, and, and an addiction that was broken. Stuff happening changes people's minds. So then it says, so much so that handkerchiefs or aprons were even being carried from his body to the sick and the diseases left them and evil spirits went out. Now, be careful here. Instruction trumps narrative every time. He's not saying, and Paul said, here's how to get healed. You just send me your hanky and I'll lay it on myself, sweat on your hanky, and I'll send it back to you and brother, you will be healed. That's not what's going on here. For your gift. Yeah, for your, for your gift of $29 or more, you know, here's the, yeah, a month. <laughs> here's what happens. Something powerful was happening so much that it was happening around him. It wasn't, he, Paul wasn't thinking it happened because of him. Paul was thinking it happened because of God. God was performing things. And it was truly happening. Listen, if God wants to use a donkey to preach a sermon, he's able to do it. And if God wants to use a handkerchief to heal a guy, he's able to do it. Don't tell God what he's allowed to do. But here's what it says. Evil spirits were dr being driven out. Can I just make the argument that in Ephesus, there were plenty of evil spirits to be driven out? And here's the thing. Also, some of the Jewish exorcists, these are guys you want to get to know, went from place to place, attempted to name over those who had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, I adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish priest, were doing this. An evil spirit recognized him and said, I know who Jesus is, I know who Paul is, but who are you? I've always loved that verse. Because out of the darkness of the, of the pit comes the truth. I don't know what you think you're doing, but you're not one of them. And this is somebody who's trying to look like they have a faith they don't have, trafficking in unlived truth and preaching a faith they don't believe. And the man in whom was the evil spirit leapt on him, subdued all of them, overpowered them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. This is the word for they were utterly exposed. You're supposed to see it both literally and poetically. This became known to all the Jews and Greeks who lived in Ephesus and fear fell upon them. And, and the name of the Lord Jesus was being magnified. Even out of the darkness, God is still reigning over all. The magnificent Savior we have will be exalted in the earth. And it says, many also of those who believed kept coming, confessing, and disclosing their practices. It didn't say Paul devised something where he would send people around to examine your life and get you to stop doing evil. Because I think that's how we do it. We ratchet up the rules. That's not what happened here. What it says is, that as they were impacted by the power of God, the sheer power of a magnificent God overcame them. And they started saying, I gotta get this right. I, I gotta bring this in. I've been at youth conferences where I watch kids get clean and get honest before God. Many of those who practice magic brought their books together and began burning them in the sight of everyone. You're gonna hear people from the university say, well, those original book burnings were Christian, you know. 
This doesn't say that Paul went and got their books. This says they brought them willingly, and it says that their hearts were evil and they were living in darkness. This was a moment to be set free, okay? It says that, and they counted up the price of them and found 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord was growing mightily and prevailing. There are six times in the book of Acts, you'll see the lines, so the word of the Lord was growing mightily and, and was prevailing. And all six are the six sections that the book of Acts was originally written in. But what's interesting is this. All of this is happening and people are getting more and more upset. Now, verse 23, about that time, an occurrence of no small amount became disturbing because of the people of the way. There was a man by the name of Demetrius. He was a silversmith. By the way, you should know a coppersmith is the one who ended up having Paul arrested in the end. A silversmith is the one who tried to get him killed here. So he has problems with the metallurgy unions. I'm not sure what Paul was doing, but he had a problem with the guys who worked metal. Demetrius, a silversmith who was making silver shrines of Artemis, making trinkets to sell in the trinket place, was bringing no little business to craftsmen, meaning he was bringing a lot of business to the craftsmen. These he gathered together and the workmen of the similar trades and said, men, you know that our prosperity depends upon this business. You preach this. You, some of you have taught this in Bible schools. Some of you have taught this to, to, to meetings to people. And he says, you see in here that not only in Ephesus, but in all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away considerable numbers of people saying that the gods made with hands are no gods at all. How shocking. He actually believes that when I went into my shop and made this God, that it's not a God even though I made it just now. You gotta be asking yourself, yeah, you just made it. It was a piece of metal or a piece of clay just a minute ago. How did it suddenly become so powerful? It, you know, when people live in their own lack of logic long enough, they can say even stupid things out loud and sound like they're profound. And in a room where everyone agrees, it doesn't mean the truth is being told. It means they don't have enough friends. If, if everybody agrees with you in your life, you need more friends. Okay, that's what I think is happening. Our trade is in danger. We are gonna be held in disrepute. And the temple of the great goddess, oh, Artemis, will be regarded as worthless. All Asia, the world worships, and she will be dethroned from her magnificence. Well, my question is, if she's all powerful, how's Paul gonna stop that? A five foot bald guy from Tarsus is gonna topple the great Artemision. And your argument is that she's a God, that, that, that there's, a, there's a real spiritual thing on the line here over this guy. So you know the story. And they begin to cry out, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Now, in the middle of this, it says Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia, it says the city was filled with confusion. They rushed into the theater, dragging Gaius and Aristarchus. So Paul's not here. His companions get dragged in here. When Paul wanted to go into the assembly, Paul's out there going, let me in, let me, I got something to say, let me in. And it says the Asiarchs, those are the guys that were in the other building that we were talking to you from earlier. The Asiarchs, who were friends of his, sent to him repeatedly and urged him not to venture into the theater. So then some were shouting one thing, some were shouting another, for the assembly was in confusion and the majority did not know for what reason they had even come. That is so classic. There's a bandwagon effect and people are, ah, there's something going on, yeah, I'm against it. You know, they don't even know what it is. I was in Thessaloniki, Greece, and I didn't realize that I was uh, walking in a protest against my country. I, I really didn't mean to, I was just trying to get to a fish restaurant. But I happened to come onto the street and there was a whole bunch of people yelling something. And I didn't know what they were yelling. I'm like, okay, well, they're going my way. Well, here I am, I'm in an anti-American. I'm almost sure that I'm probably gonna be in trouble someday for walking there. And it says, after quieting the crowd, the town clerk, the town clerk, is the grammatus, he's the guy who ran the other building and did the shuttling between. He comes and says, men of Ephesus, what man is there after all who does not know the city of the Ephesians is the guardian of the temple? And he basically calms them down. So you've got the setting in both buildings where the man works and where his office is, 
and where he came and did the work. I just want to take a moment, shift gears from Acts 19 and go to Revelation chapter 2, beginning in verses 1, 1 up to verse 7. And I want you to see what Jesus said. Because in the verses, Jesus writes, and you know, I hope by now you're anticipating that for me, I think the most important part of the entire letter is Jesus' introduction of himself. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands says this, I know your deeds, your toil and your perseverance, and that you cannot tolerate evil men and you put them to the tests, those who call themselves apostles and they are not, and you found them to be false. And you have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake and have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Therefore, remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first, or else I will come to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. Yet this you do have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. The longer I study Revelation, the more I keep looking for, dipping into a well that doesn't, you don't find the bottom of, and coming away refreshed with who Jesus is. And I want to tell you something. I only made it through COVID by constantly going back and studying who Jesus is. Personally, I went back over and over and over. My favorite message became Revelation 1 and then looking at the descriptions of Jesus in Revelation. And it was because I felt like we were being drawn with our eyes to so many things that they were being drawn from our Savior. And he is magnificent. To the angel of the church in Ephesus, write, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands, says this. You know what I love? Jesus says, I am the one who is engaged in my church. Whatever you're doing, wherever you're serving, whatever work it is, can I just tell you, Jesus is there and he knows what you're going through. This is not the one aloof from the seven churches. This is the one walking among their lampstands. I know your deeds and your toil and your perseverance. I, I just would stop and say the work that you are doing in ministry, guys, ladies, the work that you are doing in ministry, all of you, God sees it. He's aware of it. And can we just be honest? There's a few men and women here that would be honest enough to say that most of the work of your ministry, your, your congregations, Bible study people don't even know. You spend hours trying to get it right. You spend hours counseling with that person whose heart is broken. There is not a labor you do that Jesus doesn't know. And he says to them, I, I know what you're doing. I also know that you cannot tolerate evil men and put to the test those who call themselves apostles and they are not, and you found them to be false. I, I just want to point out that standing for truth is tough. Standing for truth is necessary. And Jesus knows when you stand for truth. And then it says, you have perseverance. You've endured for my name's sake, and you've not grown weary. This is how I know I'm not in that church. I I've gotten tired out. How about you? There have been a few times along the way in the ministry trail where I thought, there is just not energy enough for me to throw at this anymore. And there are just times when people, people get peopled out. This church was known by Jesus to have endured through some very tough things and, and still bounced back and still got up on a Monday morning and still felt saved. And then it says, this is what I have against you. It's very simple, very straightforward. You have left your first love. I want you to notice this. Number one. Who's your number one? And the simple icon is... The whole ball game for them wasn't that they weren't working, wasn't that they weren't persevering, wasn't that they weren't enduring, it's that their priority was off. Something happened 
that caught their attention and drew their heart away. It's possible to do everything right, but have left your love. I can't tell you how many people I sat down in a counseling chamber with who were, who were phoning in their marriage. For reasons I don't know, just one day they just stopped really put, making it a priority. And uh, ultimately he says they did this to him. Therefore, remember from where you have fallen. Interesting, the Artemision is higher than the city. The, the, the temple for love was higher. Remember that you've fallen from a high place. Repent, Methanoel, turn around, change what you're doing, and do the deeds you did at first. Is anybody here um, willing to admit that when you first came to Christ, when you first committed your heart to Jesus, that you had a zeal that you've never quite had again? There was a zeal. Man, I was gonna set the world on fire with the gospel. And, and honestly, he says, I want you to go back to the first deeds or else I'm coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. Jesus said, if I'm not going to be first, I'm not going to be there. If, if I'm not going to be the one you're proclaiming. Uh, one great preacher said, no man can preach Christ and himself at the same time. No woman can preach Christ or, and, and herself at the same time either. You're not off the hook if you're if you're a female here. Bottom line here, something's gonna come from your life, a thorough knowledge of who Jesus is. I, when I did my first sermon, I failed. My, my homiletics class, I had to get up and do a sermon. I had it well constructed. I promise you, it was a sermon to behold. And the professor only said, John Kaywood, he said this, I was left with much of Randy and little of Christ. Therefore, you have failed. Can I tell you what? I went back to the, I went back to my dorm steaming. I'm paying for this course. Who is this guy? He's a guy to whom now I smile often because he's sitting with Jesus, and I smile because what he did was kick me right where I needed to be kicked. You can leave them a lot of yourself and nothing of him. Until you repent, or unless you repent. Yet this do I have. You hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He says, I love that you are willing to take a stand on truth and that you're not rolling over, but I want you to be in love with me. Can I just make one point? Laodicea at the end and Ephesus at the beginning had the same fundamental flaw underneath of them. It just manifested differently. Uh, in Laodicea, because they thought they were full but weren't, they did not put Christ as a priority. In Ephesus, for other reasons, they endured great things. It's possible to work hard for Christ and stop loving him at the same time. It's possible to, to be thrilled to lead, but not in love with the Savior. I'm going to tell you what I want most in my life. 60 years old, and this is what I want. I want to both learn to love Jesus more, and I want to leave behind a legacy of children that knew that I loved Jesus more. Knowing stuff is great. I love knowing stuff. I love studying stuff. I, you know, I'm nuts about that stuff. But it's so easy to not just be in love with Jesus. And I'm going to tell you that it's also pretty easy to be in love with the church instead of being in love with Jesus. And you, I think we think we don't say it in a way people can hear it. Can I just tell you, people who are spiritually mature can hear it. They're going, that guy's great. That gal's great. But I'm not hearing love for Jesus. So I guess the, if I had anything to say, I would say this. If my life is going to amount to anything, it's going to amount to me learning right now in this part of my life to love my Savior. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. I hear a lot of teaching about a lot of things, but I haven't heard us talk enough about falling in love with him again. So there's one sin that derails and causes all the other sins. If my heart's not on keeping the main thing, the main thing, loving and serving my Savior, 
then all the other things are added unto it in a negative way. Okay? I love these letters. I hope they've been good for you. I hope that your experience in the geography and the history and culture is helpful and it's sparking new things. And I'll give you anything I have, take it and go further than I've gone. Thank you. And I will tell you that it's a joy to be with you guys. There's been a lot of laughter and I love that. I actually believe something. I cannot prove it. I don't have verses. So if I'm wrong, just correct me. But I really do believe you can tell, you can tell maturity in people's walk by how they laugh. Churches that laugh together well are just, something's going on there. Chuck Swindoll was the first person who said it. I heard it and I thought, you know, he's right. I go into these churches and you hear them laugh and you just know they love each other. They are having a good time. My number one church growth tip, would you just please like the other people in the building and that's going to make it easier for people to join? Okay. Because if you hate the ones you got, you're, he ain't giving you more. Okay. So, so we're going to go out. And we walk down a street that is called the Arcadian Way after the time of Arcadius in the fourth century. Arcade comes from this. The word arcade actually comes from an, a former Roman emperor. I hope you enjoyed our look at the city of Ephesus that was just this magnificent set of structures. But I want you to think about something. The entire letter of Jesus to the Ephesians was about their number one priority. Who did they hold at the top? What was the motivating factor? And we have to realize again that even in the 21st century, it's possible to do everything that Jesus told us and to do it with great fervency, but to lack love for him. And that number one priority will wane. Jesus wants to be first and he will not be second. And that's the letter to the Church of the Ephesians. I hope you enjoyed that time that we had together and we'll be looking for you next time on Exploring the Lands of the Bible.